what is a construction draw for someone that has like absolutely no idea that this process even existed? There are installment payments made by the lender based on the property owner's draw request. Before any kind of project starts and commences, we need to be able to allocate a certain budgeted amount for that rehabilitation rehab reserve. But essentially, you're going to be able to draw funds from that rehab reserve once a month, usually from the lender. And then from that lender, they have to go through the approval process in order for you to get that money back every month and be able to pay your general contractor in order to satisfy your contract with them and make sure that you make all parties happy in that process. And it's it's a very legal, safe way to do it. Mm -hmm. I've and had a lender construction draw application rejected or just put on hold because one of the items that the contractor said was completed was not completed. We were able to find on the photos of the inspection report that I think it was a staircase and ADA renovations were not completed. So we had to go back and tell a contractor, we need proof that this was completed. And we're going to request proof of that from the property manager, along with the construction manager. And just be aware of this. If you are working with a construction company that is not based in the state of where you're renovating, if they're based out of state and they're just traveling in order to be there for the project, they might have already left the project without having it fully completed. So they have to be able to make sure that it's done. Otherwise, it's not going to get funded. Okay, welcome to another episode of Affordable Housing and Real Estate Investing. And today, we're going to be covering something really technical, construction draws. Andrea, welcome back to the show. I'm so glad to have you here. What's going on with you? Oh, man, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for bringing me on. And, and it's funny, when we first met, I thought to myself, how can I be able to provide as much value as possible with what I've learned in affordable housing, multifamily investing for the last six years, and condense it into small segments of a podcast. And that's essentially what we're doing today. Um, I'm going to break down the process of what it is to go through the construction draw process and what that means and how you, we can be able to better help multifamily owners and operators actually be able to disperse funds to their general contractors efficiently and in a timely manner. So it, you, they don't have any trip ups. There's no delays in paying your general contractor because honestly, it, I've seen these processes take a long time if you don't know what you're doing. And it'll right. ultimately upset your general contractor who's working on your multi million dollar deal, or even if it's thousands of dollars, if you don't know the correct process of providing the steps to the lender and to be all parties included. So that's why I'm excited to be here and give wow. people the, <laughs> the mistakes that I learned in the beginning and how long it took me. <laughs> wow, you are on a roll. Well, let I. I think you have a track history of providing so much value to the audience. Let's start with what we can do for you first, Andre. Like, what's going on in your business, and what do you need right now? Uh, what are you looking for? Tell, oh, us, tell us a little bit more. I'm so excited for this business. Um, so, about a year ago, I started with uh, our group called Armada REI, and essentially, what we're doing is investing in multifamily assets that are primarily based in Ohio at the moment. But right now, we're actually expanding into other markets to be able to purchase properties that are between 30 to 150 units and all value add. And I'm specifically focused on value add properties that are in good neighborhoods because I want to be able to instill the knowledge I've acquired over the last couple of years, be able to provide tenants with really beautiful quality housing. And if there is a tenant um, Section 8 voucher attached to it, that's fine. I know how to work with HUD in the process of that. But ultimately, we're looking for deals in Ohio uh, that are value add, or we're also looking for capital partners that want to learn how to invest in multifamily and have generational wealth. And they can get that through tax uh, depreciation, appreciation, uh, the tax benefit, and then they can also uh, get cash flow, which is the biggest bonus. I love that. Wow. You have definitely practiced that. Like that came off so smooth, Andrea. And like, this is the reason why I've been consistently looking for ways to partner with you on deals. Um, so for the audience that's listening out there, make sure you guys are looking out and paying attention for what Andrea just said about her value add deals and in her markets uh, between 30 to 150 units. Make sure you look out because you want to work with Andrea because we're about to get into the meat of the discussion right now. Um, yes. Andrea, let's, let's just talk about construction draws. What, what is a construction draw for someone that has like 
absolutely no idea that this this process even existed. So essentially what a construction draw process is is where they're draw they're in their installment payments. So their installment payments made by the lender um, based on the property owner's draw request. Before any kind of project starts and commences, we need to be able to allocate a certain budgeted amount for that rehabilitation rehab reserve. That's what it's called. It's called rehab reserve. That's what we call it. But essentially, you're going to be able to draw funds from that rehab reserve once a month, usually from the lender. And then from that lender, they have to go through the approval process in order for you to get that money back every month and be able to pay your general contractor. So it's essentially installment payments. The construction draws are installment payments that you're going to be able to procure to the general contractor in order to satisfy your contract with them and make sure that you make all parties happy in that process. And it's a very legal way. It's a safe way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and the lender is able to be able to provide you with the benefit that they are the ones doing the, ins they hire somebody to do the inspection to make sure that the general contractor is not lying to you. <laughs> I mean, that's such a better, it makes me feel better about the whole process, right? After hearing that, because we all heard about bad contracts, especially in the single family world where they might run out with your capital. But in this case, someone's holding on to the money. You got to prove that the work has been done yes. by sending out an inspector before anybody ever gets paid. So exactly, I love that. Well, you said installment payments, Andrea. Like what, is there like a best practice for how to separate out the milestones like is it just really just like a once a month thing or do, do you recommend from your experience is there a certain milestone that needs to be done like oh all the flooring is done on the first floor or all the whatever is like how do you separate out on when it's a good time for a draw maybe that's a better question so before you start the construction draw process, your team has to be able to know what is the potential timeline for this project to be completed. And this is just the general hard costs of the project. And that's going to include a full billing statement that you're going to get every month from the contractor. And it's going to include essentially line items that are going to be um, deducted and said, okay, this is how much we allocated for windows, this is how much we allocated for flooring um cleaning all kinds of items so from that budgeted billing you have to be able to go back and see how it matches up with the budget that you've already allocated and see what percentage has been drawn down if you want to know the process i actually made note of the process that i've been through um do you would you like to know the process of yeah uh, absolutely let's pull okay. back the curtains let's uh let's get people right into okay. how those sausages made so essentially, once the ownership team has reviewed the first general contractor billing, what we have to do is punch in the values into your already completed budget to see what percentage has been aligned with your progress estimated uh, timeline. So then after you're able to see that it matches up, you make sure that you sign off on the billing along with the general contractor and the architect and anybody else that it's usually the general contractor and the architect and your team that has to sign off on the billing before you submit it to the lender. And then once it's sent back to the GC, you let them know that we're going to start engaging what's called the draw request. So usually with step two of this is that prior to engaging that first draw request to the lender, you need to reach out to the lender so that you can obtain a quote for inspection. And what happens is that they engage a third party appraiser to be able to go to the site and do the inspection, construction progress inspections. And that's usually going to cost your team. I've seen anywhere it costs between $500 to $2,000 per month, and that's per inspection. So you, you guys need to make sure that you're fully signed off and you agree with the billing. And once you approve the lender's quote, what they do is they send you what's called the project number that will be allocated to that assigned construction project. And it's going to be referenced every, every time you do the um, draw inspection request. From there, uh, while you're engaging the property 
uh, construction progress inspection with the inspector, you also need to separately get a quote from your title company in order for them to give you what's called a title update report. So what's it's better known as a date down endorsement so that you know that there's been no changes in title or liens put on the property in order for you to be able to get that funding from the lender. So step one, Make sure, just to recap this, the construction draw process, step one of the first billing is that you're you're supposed to be able to review the first general contractor billing, make sure it aligns with what you need. Step two, essentially, it's prior to engaging the draw request, you need to get your lender quote from the inspector. And you also need to get the quote for the title update because you're going to be submitting that every time you're doing a draw request, the title update and the inspection report. And then from there, I'll give you the full details of what needs to be <laughs> included in, in your packages. Oh my God. Yes. Let's talk about what do we... It's a great, great explanation there. It seems like there's a lot of communication that needs to take place during that to make sure like, hey, it's a lot of coordination. You got to make sure the lender is there, GC's on board, architect's aware, and then also getting a title company. I did not know about that part of the process at all. That actually makes a lot of sense. Um, yes, the people involved are usually going to be exactly what you said. It's going to be the ownership team, whoever's running point on the deal. It's going to be your asset manager, your construction project manager, general contractor, the lender, the title company, along with the third party inspector that's going to come to the site to see review the inspections. Those are usually the seven people involved. Wow. So before those seven people are even involved, what you, you mentioned a little bit earlier about punching in the budget and making sure that you're aligning yourself with the budget line item details like windows, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What documents do you need to submit with your draw application? Usually with the first draw application, uh, there's a checklist of items you need to submit to the lender, which usually includes your first billing of the renovation project. Maybe it's $500,000, whatever it is. You also need to submit what's called a conditional lien waiver with the billing so that all subcontractors have signed off conditionally on it. It also has to include a wire authorization with instructions of what is going to be receiving the funding what account you also need your gc contract for the renovations your certificate of liability which is going to include your evidence of property insurance and your builder's risk insurance you need your rent roll the inspection report along with proof of payment and you also need the title update with proof of payment and on top of that, there might be additional items too. You're usually going to have to send the lender um, what the general contractor's contact information along with the uh, inspection invoices that, that are potentially going to be paid outside of the billing. And um, you also need your borrower's contact information. Got it. Well, maybe a question for someone that's wondering right now, like, hey, why do you need to involve a title company? And if I were to say it back to you, right? Is it because you simply want to make sure that no one else is putting a lien against the title while the lender is kind of paying out these funds? Exactly. That's exactly right. right. So whenever uh, the lender, what they prefer is to make sure they include two of those third parties to make sure that whatever is being submitted is kosher. <laughs> so the title company, what they usually do is produce what's called a date down endorsement. And that is the cheapest form of you guys to be able to get back a report. It's maybe like $80, less than $100. And it just shows that there's been no change in title since the last title update. But if you want something more co comprehensive and cohesive, just make sure you ask your lender what kind of title update they want, because the title updates can range anywhere between $80 up to $4,000 for one report. So you need to be able to be very clear what is sufficient to submit to you guys. Do you need a date down endorsement or do you need an informational commitment? So be very clear because that's going to affect your costs. And that's what's wow. called your soft costs. So there's hard costs and soft costs. The hard costs are essentially what's on the general contractor contract. The soft costs are anything that's paid outside of that contract, which could include your inspection fees, title update fees, uh, designer fees, FF&E, architectural fees. Um, so you have to know what are hard costs and soft costs when it comes to construction budgeting. Wow. Uh, I mean, it seems like there's so many moving parts on all of these items here. How long does it actually take for these draws to take place? Because it seems like you're, you're, it's like you're, you're doing these draws every month, but it sounds like every there's a month. massive amount of coordination. So 
it, does this happen like over a two week period or one week period every single month? Tell us a little bit more about what that might look like for our audience. In members. my experience, this has taken maybe about two weeks. That's the long, longest I feel like it should take you on your end as an owner of multifamily. It should take you less than two weeks to make sure everything is packaged up and prettied up to send to the lender. I usually give the lender two weeks of that extra of that month in order for them to be able to assess the report in order for them to get it back and review that it makes everything makes sense and for them to disperse the funding what's required usually with general contractors is payment within 30 days but if you're going to work with a contractor you need to let them know this is going to be funded through the rehab reserve and it could take anywhere between 30 to 60 days to fund so they need to be prepared for that if your general contractor is not prepared to wait to receive that money, your team needs to be aware that you can potentially have to fund this out of pocket from your own pocket until you receive the money from the lender. It's funny the way it works because your team as an owner is submitting it through the lender in the beginning to be able to make sure that all this makes sense. But sometimes if you're working with an impatient general contractor, you might have to fund it out of pocket if it's past the 30 days. So just be prepared for that. Yeah. And I always think about this is a lot about relationships and expectation setting, because if you don't have a good relationship with a builder or a, or a GC, and they're not a big operation, you could be running in the space where it's a very cash flow dependent type of business where they're depending on your capital to pay their subcontractors or oh, their yeah. employees and fronting for their materials. This is why you guys got to keep on top uh, for the listeners, keep it really top of mind that they're running their own business. We know that there is administrative hurdles that you have to cross, but you have to set these expectations up front. So they're not angry at you. Should it take the full 60 days from the time they invoice you to the time they actually get a payment. And I think, Having that relationship is just so important. Um, Definitely. I feel like this podcast is specifically for multifamily owners who are planning to do any kind of a large scale rehab or any kind of a rehab that's reserved through the lender, which is what you do, which is the construction draw process. It's also for contractors who are construction contractors to be aware that these are the timelines in which you can receive money back in order to fund the projects, in order to pay your con- your subcontractors, exactly what you just said. Oh so, yeah, um, you, can, you cannot be a, a a paycheck to paycheck type of person um, on the GC <laughs> side for some of these large projects. Um, yes. Well, Andrea, uh, how? Well, let let's let's get straight to the scary part, right? Because this is one one of the objectives of our podcast to remove the fear from people and say, "Oh no, what if I do something wrong? Um, what what if I don't? What if I get denied from a construction draws?" Let's start with first, like, what scenarios would you get a construction draw denied? Like, what have you learned from your experience? Like, any sort of stories or examples of why something might get denied? Oh, I was afraid we'd come to this part. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but you're right. It's happened to me before. Uh, I've had a lender construction draw application rejected or just put on hold because one of the items that the contractor said was completed was not completed because of the result of the inspection report, we were able to find on the photos of the inspection report that uh, I think it was the staircase and AD, ADA renovations were not completed. So we had to go back and tell a contractor, we need proof that this was completed and we're going to request proof of that from the property manager along with the um, construction manager. So that that makes a lot of sense. I think, yes. that, but it also keeps everybody honest, right? So that just because you might not be on the site every single day, somebody else is still checking to make sure that the work is done. I think it's like yes. good practice, but it's almost that must have been stressful. How long did it take to kind of get that remediated? Like another extra month or two? No, it actually took about a week. Oh, and great. this is the issue. If you have a gen, just be aware of this as a multifamily owner. If you are working with a construction company that is not based in the state of where you're renovating if they're based out of state and they're just traveling in order to be there for the project they might have already left the project without being it having it fully completed so you need to be able to make sure you're working very well with your property manager your maintenance manager along with the contractor to make sure that those pro the projects that they've 
promise were completed will be completed. So they have to be able to make sure that it's done. Otherwise, it's not going to get funded. And and that's not a situation that anybody would really want to be in. No. They just issued an invoice and they're not getting paid. That's the biggest trip up. It's if the photos on the inspection report don't match up with the billing and the billing says it's done and it's not done, that can cause weeks of delays. Oh, man. So, I mean, all right. So if if the construction job does get denied, uh, obviously there are remedies that usually take place. Is there anything else that typically a multifamily investor might need to do to remedy the situation? Is it just like, hey, just do what you said you were going to do and listen to the lender? <laughs> As a multifamily investor, you need to make sure that you're delivering great promises. <laughs> you're under promising and over delivering for your investors. So if you are in a situation where you're not, the construction project is not fully completed, you said it was completed, your contractor said it was completed, but it's not, you're going to have to essentially step in with your asset manager and your property manager and any local people that are on site to help you finish what's on the application. Otherwise, the lender will not fund it. So the lender has to go by what these third parties are telling them is accurate. And once you have proof that it is completed, it will get funded. You also be, have to be aware as a multifamily owner that you ne- you might potentially have to fund it out of pocket if you're really delayed in providing funding back to the general contractor. Yeah, it's almost like when you raise capital for some of these deals, you got to have contingencies in place, additional reserves, because these, when you have such a large project, things just naturally, something has to go wrong. I mean, somebody makes a mistake somewhere. Uh, also, at some point. I feel like the good, bad, and the ugly has happened in any which way. It's not <laughs> the ugly I have seen in multifamily affordable housing is that whenever you're going through a construction draw process, one of the issues could be that nothing has the full, the project has not been fully delivered as it was said to be 100% completed. There's been fires, there's been, um, you know, flooding, everything. You need to be able to make sure you have contingencies for all of those scenarios. Oh man, I, for, I forgot about those weird scenarios or those acts of God or whatever. So, I mean, when you have those issues like a flood or a fire, what might happen? Do you have to inform the lender, one, hey, this is what happened. Two, you have to get insurance payments to cover the the repairs. Like, is that what is the process there if something bad like that happens? Usually, if something like a fire were to occur or a flood, those are unexpected obviously but you it should have been covered under your insurance that's why insurance requirements from a lender before the construction starts are very clear you need to be able to have what's called builder's risk and that's for the general contractor along with your own insurance for the property itself and on top of that insurance you guys need to be able to make sure you have your own rehab reserve internally not just with the lender but internally in order for you guys to potentially do what's called extra capex capital expenditure work wow okay got it all right well we just went through so many different items associated with construction jobs and we talked about like how it happens every single month is there I mean, people are filling out the form and saying like, this is how much you should draw. Like, is there another way to say like, hey, what are the milestones that should be done? Or is it just simply like, hey, on a monthly basis, whatever gets done gets paid out of based off an allocation of budget. How should people look at it that way? Because we have single family investors, we have multifamily investors. I'm just trying to see if I can simplify that thought process for people. Like, how do you determine draw schedule? To determine a draw schedule, you need to be able to make sure that you're working with the construction budget and your asset manager and construction manager at the same time. Those three components need to be verified along the way. And usually the timeline to complete those items, it could be sporadic as long as it's within, for us, it's six months. We do six month renovations. We're in and out. We make sure everything's completed, but some, and Sometimes it could be less time than that. It could be four months, three months. You just need to be be able to make sure that you're speaking consistently with the general contractor and they tell you what's the construction schedule. And that construction schedule is usually what's provided prior to the final retention billing. Um, and if you'd like, I could go through with you what what's included in the retention billing, which yes. is the final billing. That's different. Let's do it. Let's, uh, let's talk about the difference between... Well, a progress draw sounds really straightforward, but maybe just tell us the difference. Is there a lot of 
different documentation in the first draw compared to a progress draw compared to a final draw? Mm, the first draw is going to include all those items I mentioned recent prior. Um, the progress draws will only include the billing, the title update, and the inspection report. Those are in between. But the final retention draw, that's going to include everything that was billed up to that point, 100% completed with no retention, no retainage from the general contractor. And it's going to have a conditional lien waiver for the final amount requested, the unconditional lien waiver for the prior billing, the rent roll as well, the lender's reserve disbursement form, wire authorization, along with all the final closeout documents. And those closeout documents for a construction draw could include fully executed change orders that happen in the process, the AIA, what's called the G704, the Certificate of Substantial Completion, G706, the contractor's affidavit of payments and debts of claims. G706A, and that one is the contractor's affidavit of release of liens. The closeout book, the project schedule, punch list sign-off, uh, the third-party appraiser inspection invoice and proof of payment, and the title update proof of payment. There might be some more items, but that's essentially it. <laughs> oh, man. Talk about being specific. You got the exact form numbers in there. So this is why I tell people you got to partner with Andrea if you're working on a big project like this. Like, I don't know anybody else can rattle off form numbers. At, it's like as technical <laughs> as the IRS, but way more helpful <laughs> in terms of like providing the value there. Wow, that is a huge package. And let me see how I can tie this all together, right? So after you get your final package in, uh, assuming this is the value add deal. I remember you came onto the podcast before and talked to us about the rent comparability study and all that stuff, right? Is this the good part or, or the part where you start applying for rent increases after all the renovations are done? Like help the listeners tie it all together. We just got really technical, right? With the construction yes. jobs. We got very technical with this. Um, I want multifamily owners to know that this shouldn't be an intimidating process. All the items I just mentioned prior will be items that the lender will tell you you need to provide. But this is just so you can get ahead of it and you know what are the possible costs included when it comes to up engaging these third parties like the inspection report or the title update. So every month, you guys as an operator will be spending anywhere between $500 to $2,000 just to be able to work with the lender and produce the progress payments for your general contractor. But I want uh, multifamily owners to know that if you are investing in affordable housing and you are going through this construction drop process schedule, whole mishmash, <laughs> you need to be able to make sure that your funding has already been provided by HUD as, a res as you're going to support the rents with this construction project. So anytime what's called, uh, whenever we're about to increase rents in affordable housing, we do what's called the chapter 15 markup to market. And that's where we do a full scale rehab on the project. You're going to be able to include the potential construction budget in that markup to market package to HUD so that you can get the funding of the big rent increase from HUD in order to support your potential uh, construction updates, your construction schedule, essentially. And uh, from there, you're able to get funding and keep the same rents over the next couple of years, if not increased rents with what's what we call the OCAF. And that's going to be included in other previous podcasts we've done. Yeah. And for folks that are listening right now for the first time, uh, Andrea and we did a whole podcast episode on how to increase rents. We talked about a chapter 15 markup to market. Um, so much terminology that I learned there. And I'll be honest, I, I told Andrea just the other day, somebody sent me a 60 unit deal and I was like, oh, there, I was looking at the, the HUD contract day and I was like, oh, there might be a rent comparability study that we can do. And I have actually applied what Andrea has taught all of us to a deal. Uh, this is not a conceptual thing. I think if you're able to articulate and understand comprehensively what Andrea is doing, you can apply them to deals and see opportunities that you might not have seen before. Um, like just going through the details of different construction jobs, what it really comes down to is that value add and the rent increase potential that jacks up your NOI and potentially provides huge, massive swings in the valuation of your property. So Yes, I will tell investors that uh, whenever you are about to go through this process of doing what's called a full-scale rehab renovation, people, this is included usually outside of the capital expenditures. 
So you have your operating expenses as an operator, which is your unit turns, your maintenance, the cleaning, the contracts. But then you also have what's called capital expenditures in a budget. In an NOI statement, you're going to see potentially CapEx listed there, which are extraordinary expenses outside of the normal operating everyday operations. But then beside that, you're going to have your rehab construction budget and that's going to be separate from your capex the reason it's separate is because it's funded differently it's funded either through bridge equity or already um equity that you've paid with a lender and you allocate that rehab reserve with the lender in order to make sure that you're able to receive rent increases through that rehab reserve completion so you just as an overall multifamily operator it sounds intimidating in the beginning when you're trying to figure out what to allocate, what to expense, but just make sure you're working with the right team. You need to make sure that you have a great accounting firm or a great accounting CPA that could be able to allocate those and separate those expenses, whether it's operational, CapEx, or the rehab reserve for a full-scale renovation. And that's also going to be taxed differently, especially if it's a tax credit renovation that is way more detailed information that you need to provide to the lender in order to get your funding back from the rehab reserve. Interesting. So the rehab reserve, the con- the construction budget, right? Is that what we're calling it? That's important to keep separate from your capital expenditures because CapEx might just be like, hey, I'm improving the the HVAC, I'm guessing, as an example. But the rehab construction is like this massive full-scale renovation that you're talking about that is, is it related to the purchase? I just want to make sure the audience can understand like, hey, I, how do I separate the rehab reserve from the CapEx? Like, what's a good example? Um, rehab reserves yeah. are separated from the CapEx usually because they are taxed differently and allocated through the tax. Um, d- they are allocated through taxes differently, but also they are reserved through the lender and we're able to draw with, with the mm. construction draws for that rehab reserve. And that is going to receive a higher budget versus what's in the CapEx. CapEx may be budgeted, let's say 20,000 a year, but your rehab is probably going to be in the millions. And that's Mm -hmm. going to be, let's say $20,000 a unit. And that will not include your exterior renovations. And that's just going to tell you that's going to be based off of a rehab schedule along with tenant relocation plan you might have to relocate tenants in that process and put them in down units or put them up in hotels so you need somebody who can really work with your team in order to have um, a great smooth process in the construction uh, rehab uh, uh, journey (laughs) yeah i mean this is serious i think for people that that underestimates like how complex it is like i used to live in an apartment and i remember when they were renovating just the floors like i had my entire living room with like plastic drapes all over it i've had friends that had to get re- relocated to hotels uh, themselves and they lived out of a hotel for a couple of months while the renovation was going on so these are real life scenarios remember you're, you're dealing with people's lives and yes. you are renovating their home while you're trying to increase rent so you gotta be be mindful and be be compassionate about you're you're disrupting the people's lives and you got to take care of them and um, usually what we do is hire a relocation Mm. tenant relocation coordinator that person's going to help if it's not somebody that your team as an operator allocates on site as either the property manager or the maintenance manager you need to have somebody who's specialized in relocating tenants you're going to have town hall meetings in order to let the tenants know this is going to be the process this is who you can contact if you have any questions you know you're you are messing with the livelihoods and where people live while you're going through a full-scale rehab so you need to be as communicative as possible as an operator and as an investor yeah and i and I think to kind of tie it all back together, when you guys are setting setting aside the rehab construction budget or the reserve, that allows you to keep your accounting way more clean so that when you go and submit, I'm assuming the markup to market report for rent increases, then you are able to keep the finances a lot more clean and support why you're expecting or proposing a rent increase for the entire project. Yes. Did I, did I say that correctly? Wow, yes. I have learned from you, Andrea. You've See? learned so much. You guys were able to essentially hire a cost segregation specialist in order for yes. them to segregate those costs that you've incurred operationally, CapEx, or through the rehab. 
So it's very important for you guys to know the difference between those three expenses when it comes to the property and how you are able to get funding for those expenses. Wow. Uh, this has been been a masterclass. This, I feel like this is one of those <laughs> those uh, podcast episodes that people pay like twenty, thirty thousand dollars just to be part of a mastermind, Andrea, just to learn. I from wish, you, you know. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> I wish, you know. When I first started in this industry, nobody teaches you this unless you work in it every mm. day, and people are telling you, "Oh, did you get this? Did you forget that?" So they don't teach this in normal education college classes. You learn this along the process of working with other experienced operators, and I've been blessed enough. Mm -hmm to be hired by one of the largest multifamily operators in the country and just learning this process along the way, always ask questions, reach out to mm. people who know more than you. Don't be afraid to ask the questions because yes. you're not going to know it all. Um, and there's always little intricacies involved with these projects, but the main reason why I'm doing this podcast is because nobody taught me about this and I'm so blessed that I'm able to learn what's included along the way and just to be able to give some tips to potential multifamily operators of what's wow. gonna what's coming i mean we are blessed that you would come on to share all your amazing knowledge from your years of experience um is there right. anything else that people should know about when it comes to construction jobs any other tips or tricks or things that that you've learned from your career that people need to watch out for or implement into their business today i feel like you are as strong as your weakest link on the team and you need to have a very strong team when it comes to doing anything involving in multifamily. I'm blessed in order to know that I have a very strong team behind me and I can provide the value to them through my knowledge and experience. So be able to understand what are your strengths and how you can contribute to the project with those strengths. Find people who don't have your strengths and they can help you close these multifamily deals renovate them, get increase the market rents, and just be able to make sure that you work with your property management team in order to make all this come true. You're essentially playing, you're not, you're playing with the lives of other people. So you need to be fully committed to understanding that, that you are messing with people's living. And it's a big responsibility for people to understand that that communication is key whenever you're doing any kind of a construction project and the construction draw process should be handled by an operator. Some property managers offer to do it for you, but I highly recommend you coordinate this as an operator in multifamily and you're able to work with all parties included that I mentioned in this previous ep in this episode itself. Oh, that's such a great tip. Um, having a strong team in communication seems so basic, so, so fu fundamental, but it makes the biggest difference for everyone from their experience working with you. You want the lender to like you. You want the GC to like you. And most importantly, you want the tenants to be super happy about the entire project. So please, yes. please, guys, if you're listening to this, please keep that in mind. Uh, please always have a kind heart. And when in doubt, please err of the side of doing the right thing doing a good thing and taking care of other people, even if it costs you just a little bit more money. I think it's so important that we take that mindset and do things the right way. Uh, I think that's Absolutely. really what we want to kind of preach on this podcast. Yes. And, and I will say that um, everything I just mentioned in this podcast episode about how to do the construction draw process, it applies to market rate properties along with affordable housing section eight properties. One thing to note, if you are investing in tax credit properties, you need to include a lot more detail about your soft costs and receipts of expenses, travel expenses. So you need a very good accounting system whenever, whenever it comes to tax credit renovations. That's just a little side note. Oh, that's good to know. So when in doubt, document, 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 please, everybody. Yes. Document, document, <laughs> document. <laughs> um, Andrea, have... I don't know if your answer has changed. Um, the question we have been asking everybody on a podcast is, why do you think affordable housing, particularly the lack of supply, is so hard to solve for? W what's your answer to that? Ooh. I don't know. Has your, has your perspective changed at all? Um, it's probably been a year since I brought you on a podcast, but I don't, think I, you, I don't think I asked you that question. Go ahead. What's so <laughs> hard to solve for? In yeah. Why, why is affordable housing so hard? I'm curious like, to hear your thought process on that. You know what it is? Um, 
we need to have more people who are willing to take the reins on investing in affordable housing mm. and knowing the benefits that comes with it. It includes many things. It's not just the owner operators who want to step up and take on these projects that are section eight and they have a stigma behind the tenants and what kind of tenants are going to get, but it's also government funding that needs to be allocated for more uh, tax credit bonds, uh, funding for these projects along with beautification and overall asset management of these projects because the tenants in affordable housing obviously they're making below the national income average usually they can't be charged more than 30 percent of their income so there's a stigma that these tenants are not the best tenants but you just need to be able to work with really good operators to be able to screen for great tenants and to know how to manage these projects. So I feel like a, the biggest issue to solve is just to have more people involved in affordable housing and to be able to preach the benefits of it. And you're already doing it with this podcast. You're telling people that affordable housing, even though it sounds affordable, in our minds means cheap there's nothing cheap about this industry. Affordable housing actually gets more funding than market rate deals. You're able to get way more money and be able to get tax incentives from the government by converting these to tax credit properties that get tax exemptions, meaning you don't have to pay property taxes. And you're able to provide a cause to these, to these projects. You're able to give great, these tenants beautiful class a housing with the right construction that uh construction project that you're able to implement with the business plan and what a great answer um what a great answer for you just kind of come up and i think that is the number one fight that i've been working on uh with the help of you andrea is like dispelling the myth and the stigma associated with affordable housing when people keep thinking it's like associated with guns drugs and drama when that's not the situation at all it's just parents just like ours, immigrants who might not have spoken English in the beginning and just needed a solid foundation with a good roof over their heads for their kids. Yeah. And I love that you talked about, hey, it's about providing a big home. And I've recently come to this conclusion, Andrea. It's I, I really started thinking about like, what do I want? And I got really specific. And I said, hey, I really want to be the person that brings a new resident into their apartment and show them the beautiful home that we just renovated for them give them the keys. It might be a single mom with their two kids, but to get that hug and that thank you, that is everything to me. Like I, I've really thought about the moment. And I think if I had to like dedicate my life to that, like any singular moment or experience, like that is true fulfillment in and of itself. And to have been learning from you where you've been doing it for thousands of people already, Andrea, it's truly an honor. And I, and I'm always so, so, so blessed whenever you come on and share your knowledge with everybody. So thank you so much. Thank you I so much for people that. like you. I love it's that response from you, seriously, especially when it comes to affordable housing. If we are able to find money in the budget to be able to pay for a service coordinator, I feel like that's one of the keys that could help as well. Service coordinators are able to provide community events, uh, social services, you know, meal plans, all kinds of stuff. So just see what you're your property is budgeted for, if not cr find a way to create that because it makes all the difference when people who are not making the average above minimum income, they can be able to get concierge services and feel like I'm living in an amazing area. I never want to leave. That's the biggest issue in affordable housing is retention, tenant retention. Yeah. And I think all the services that we can put in place, it's Man, we think about it, like how you truly make a difference. And I think everybody has this generic thing, like, I just want to help people. But we have put together a community of affordable housing and real estate investors that are dedicated towards helping folks specifically through housing. And you can have support services for, you know, women, domestic abuse. It could be folks, uh, kids aging out of the foster system, whoever you want to help, you have that power now. And all Andrea is doing on this podcast is equipping you with the tools and the knowledge so that you can be a little bit less afraid and go out there and go help some people exactly wherever you want to help. And there are so many people out there that can use that help. So 
Andre, thank you so much for coming on. I, I, it's always a pleasure having you on. I, I love having you on. Uh, next time we, we can cover some multifamily affordable housing terminology. I think that will be a good fundamental lesson to bring you back on for. That'll be amazing. <laughs> That'll be a lot of fun. I'm always happy to provide some more knowledge and just give people the tools that I never really learned in the beginning. Maybe some people might save over 60 grand in mentorships just by coming on your podcast and getting the tips and tricks of it, you know? So keep subscribing, keep coming on and feel free to reach out to me at Andrea Garcia REI on Instagram, Facebook, and we'll get the conversation started. Yeah. And we'll make sure we put Andrea Garcia REI, all her handles in the show notes below. Make sure you subscribe to her. Make sure you please follow her on Instagram. Like she's just a wealth of knowledge. Like I always follow her and see. And I'm I'm truly inspired by what Andrea is doing. Like she's doing triathlons. Like talk about setting an example. Like Wonder Woman. Like what what do you, what what do you not do, Andrea? I'm just so impressed. Thank I you think so I'm much. Come on to this <laughs> podcast just for the compliments. I really appreciate <laughs> you. <Ken>. I love it. <laughs> Thank you for everything you do and how much you give back. And I'm going to keep coming back as long as I'm invited. <laughs> Let's go. I love it. All right, everybody. We are out. Thank you, guys. <laughs>